Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such a wonderful show for you this evening. NASA astronaut and award-winning photographer Jay Apt is with us. We're going to talk about his background. We're going to talk about photography, so many things. And so uh, it's just going to be loads and loads of fun. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Before we get started, just a few things. First of all, socialflight.com and the Social Flight mobile apps are buzzing. The flying season is here. We have so many cool things going on. And one of those things is that, of course, we are giving away an Aspen E5 electronic flight instrument. That's a $6,000 value uh, prize. We're always giving away things in Social Flight. And all you need to do to be entered to win is get the Social Flight mobile app and just check in at your home airport, at any airport, driving by an airport. We obviously want you to get out there and fly and do as much as you can, but you really only need to check in to be entered. And for those people who do actually compete and generate lots of points, if you're in our top 30, you get an extra entry and that doubles your chances of being able to win in our challenge. So be sure to check it out, the Fly to Win Challenge. And of course, at any time that you just are on your PC, just go to socialflight.com. You can open it up. There's a burger button that you can click and see all the $100 hamburgers out there. There's tons and tons of destinations. We just want to motivate general aviation and get everyone flying. And so uh, be sure to check that out. Now, I'd like to, to introduce our next guest, and, and I'm, I'm absolutely filled with joy at being able to do this, with a resume that includes Harvard University, followed by MIT, followed by Harvard again, followed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and capped off with 847 hours in space as a NASA astronaut. Jay App's story is one of epic accomplishment. Dr. Apt has flown on four space shuttle missions, performed two spacewalks, and been to the Russian space station Mir. Uh, he's also the recipient of NASA's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal. But his roots lie just barely above Earth with the rest of us in general aviation. Jay is a pilot and aircraft owner with 6,000 hours of experience in more than 25 types of aircraft, sailplanes, and even human-powered aircraft. He's flown single-engine aircraft to Greenland, Iceland, Europe, Alaska, and Central America. And also, one of the things we're going to talk about this evening is he is an award-winning photographer and has shared his images and knowledge of the Earth in orbit with millions around the world. I'm going to bring him here online now. And I would just like to say that I am absolutely thrilled to have Jay with us tonight. So please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Jay Apt. How are you doing this evening, Jay? Jeff, this is terrific to be on Social Flight Live. I love it. You know, I've been a longtime user of the Social Flight app. And as a matter of fact, when my wife was out of town, I don't know, three or four weekends ago, used it to find an EAA pancake breakfast down in Cumberland, Maryland and flew down there from uh, Allegheny County and uh, filled my belly. So oh. thank you, Social Flight. <laughs> that is truly the nicest thing you could have said to me all evening. So we're, we're all set. <laughs> well, it's downhill from there then. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, you've got one of the coolest offices because you just look over your shoulder and there are models. There's like all these things that are tributes to different parts of your life. and. I'd like to start a little bit in, in the beginning before we get to the photography and the space with what got you started and what generated getting you to the point that you've got some GA models hanging back there as symbols of your experience. So my dad soloed in a WACO as part of the civilian pilot training program before WW2. And uh, he signed up for the Army Air Corps but since he'd had two years of mechanical engineering college, the Army in its wisdom said, you are an engineer. And uh, so they sent him to uh, Europe and he did get to install some GCA systems, but you know, mostly he was just lugging stuff around Europe and then got sent on a um, troop ship after VE day through the Panama Canal and got to Okinawa a few days after uh, the war was ended. But he, uh, 
he really triggered my interest in aviation, even though my mother, as a condition of getting married, told him he had to stop flying. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, he took me outside uh, to see aircraft, and I remember going out to Allegheny County Air Airport to see a Connie when one of those first came in. Just the most beautiful airplane, as everybody knows, uh, in the piston era. And wow. um, gee, I, I guess he even took me outside to see a satellite when it went overhead. This was when I was about 12, I guess. A big balloon, the the Echo satellite. You could see it easily with your naked eye. You know, it, not quite as easy as the International Space Station to see, but you know that that really triggered my interest. Do you remember, did did he have like a favorite airplane or was there something, I mean, it sounds like he had this passion, he got himself into uh, being able to be a pilot, but then wasn't able to to really follow some of those dreams. It was, and you have these great memories. What is it, what else do you remember that was really driving him? Well, I mean, he was an engineer. So his great drive was to make anything he saw better and uh, operate better and you know uh, learn to do maintenance and stuff like that and and I have a really early memory of him under the hood of a car uh, you know asking me to hold a flashlight <laughs> and you know it's uh, it it was just uh, great to be the son of an engineer and uh, my mom was just super organized person and so all those traits you know what else are you going to do there's there's no choice you got to fly Oh man. So what, what got you like, obviously that i read earlier uh, to everyone, your educational background and it, it's, it's just, a, you know, I don't even know the words to put behind it. It's, it's stellar and amazing. How, how does someone put themselves? How did you put yourself on a track at such a young age to get to, to get to the absolute apex of education for your whole career? Well, I mean, you know, the best advice you can give a young person is don't let school interfere with your education. <laughs> and, you know, so, so starting in middle school, some friends and I formed the Model Rocket Club and uh, did that all through high school. Uh, and my partner and I won the national team championship in Model Rockets when I was uh, a junior, I'm sorry, a sophomore in high school and then again when I was a senior and we got involved in, in a lot of that uh, and um, then in college I put aside a little bit of money uh, from a scholarship and scrimped a little bit on that and, and ended up um, being able to start flight training in the winter uh, sorry in the summer between my junior and senior years um, I was I was working that summer and uh, had some money uh, that I could put towards it. I, I of course I remember being scandalized when the wet cost of a 150 went over ten dollars an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I ended up getting uh, my private the winter of my senior year. I don't know late February early March of 1971, and uh, just flew as much as I could afford and um, any time that somebody had to reposition an airplane, well, you know the whole story. Uh, I wasn't in the kind of aviation community that some folks are where they, they transitioned immediately to fly in cargo and Lears, you know, but uh, we learned um, a lot of good stuff and flying in New England, you learned how to fly in weather pretty quick. Oh, definitely. Um, take me back for a minute to the model rocketry, because as as an astronaut, you know, lots of people talk about, well, I got interested in model airplanes and things like that. But there was a time when it seems that rocketry was the big thing as yeah. well. And it seems to drive so much innovation. And I'm fascinated that you were really involved with your friend in in doing that as a as a challenge and that you won in those things. And you know, when um, you do competitions in model rocketry, much like the AMA in uh, model aviation, there are different categories of challenge that, that you do. And um, we ended up 
not being great at everything, but being good enough at pretty much uh, everything that was being um, tested at those times. And, you know, sometimes it's just something simple, like can you get uh, a rocket with a particular size engine higher than anybody else? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a bit more complicated. You put an engine in a glider and boost it up to altitude and see how long it can glide down. In those days, we didn't have radio control as an option. Uh So you had to pick the the thermals right and, um, you know, get the wing shape and as light as you can, but no lighter because then it gets shredded on uh, the rocket engine boost. And uh, so, you know, there was a lot of good engineering. There still is. There's a terrific thing sponsored by the Aerospace uh, Industry Association and the National Association of Rocketry called TARC. that is a it used to be the team america rocketry uh challenge and and it's morphed into a different name but still the same initials and you go to tark.org and the finals are always just about now and the winning teams get scholarships to college and boy we see some terrific middle school and high school teams compete in that and actually the top team gets a trip to the Paris Air Show or Farnborough, depending on the year. Wow. Terrific. That's that's pretty impressive. I mean, I remember it was like Estes rockets and, yeah. and working uh-huh. off of that. And uh, I mean, that was, that seems to have been a big turning point in things is when I think maybe sure. Estes kind of brought it down to the rest of the world. Well, yeah, you, you stop people shoving match heads into used CO2 cartridges and blowing their face off uh, and had reliable, safe, reusable rocket motors. You mentioned to me that you actually knew Vern Estes. Yeah, I, I knew Vern Estes and uh, his wife, Lita, just terrific people. Vern was a wonderful engineer, uh, made the first machine that reliably turned out safe engines after he designed them and a terrific business person and uh, a, a terrific benefactor for kids just a all-around great individual wow um i remember certainly in in my life early on when when looking at you know and daydreaming about airplanes and my family didn't know the first thing about them you know they always encouraged me be go be an engineer and then do that stuff later so you you certainly were on that that science track coming out from that. So you're, did you transition, uh, tell me about what you did in terms of like Harvard and MIT and what you studied there that kind of led to the rest so, of your career? Uh, in, in those days, and I think it's still true, Harvard didn't have aerospace engineering, uh, didn't have much engineering at the undergraduate level at all, not an accredited engineering school. Uh, so I studied physics And then in grad school, I spent most of my time in the machine shop, which is what experimental physicists do. Uh, They spend almost all the time in the machine shop and the rest of the time fixing leaks in the vacuum system. They just build in the machine shop, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and uh, then you take data and and reduce it. And, uh, you know, I learned how to interface a computer with lasers and my PhD was in uh, laser physics in kind of the early days of that. And it was a lot of fun and uh, just, great environment, uh, a lot of history. We started out in some buildings that had been the site of the World War II RAD labs, the radiation lab, uh, which was a misnamed place intentionally to throw the bad guys off the scent. And what it was really doing was radar. Oh. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, because I was going to say, hmm, that doesn't sound like a place you'd want to spend a lot of time. <laughs> well, these were old wooden buildings, you know, thrown up in a hurry, and they were still there in the mid-70s when I was in grad school. Wow. And so uh, you did you know kind of – did you have an idea what you wanted to actually do at that time when you were going from uh, Harvard to MIT in terms of once your schooling was over, what you wanted to do? You know, I remember sitting at my desk senior year in my dorm room, Uh, I don't know, it was maybe a couple of months before finals last semester and thinking the only real employer that I want to work for is NASA. Well, it took a while um, and, and, you know, I ended up doing uh, 
what a lot of folks do, apply to a bunch of graduate schools and take the one that gives you a full ride. Uh, <laughs> and and happen to be some great folks at, at uh, MIT. Uh, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, and, and I felt it doubly there because there were a couple of folks in uh, my graduate group that later ended up getting the Nobel Prize in physics. And uh, I, I tell you, I didn't feel particularly like I was running stride for stride with them, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> but they were, all, they were all great folks and, and it, was a, it was a great time. And I got my commercial and instrument while I was in grad school. So that wasn't bad either. Wow, so that's right in our back, you know, backyard up here. So where, you, where were you flying out? Hanscom, huh? Hanscom Field, uh, executive flyers, aviation, the famous air show pilot, Mike Goulian's father, ran executive flyers. And then I went upstairs and got my commercial with Frank Comerford of Comerford Aviation. That's a neat place. And of course, now that's MIT Lincoln Labs is already is right over there as well. That's it's, it's, yeah. it seems to be this, this kind of cradle of, of modern technology happening in that area. So you were certainly in the right place. What kind of airplanes were you flying? Well, Cradle of Modern Technology didn't actually describe them too very well. They were ratty 150s. You remember that old kind of Halloween purple and brown paint job that they had for a while? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think the only reason they flew was they repelled the ground. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, if, if you had one radio in uh, 172 when I was getting an instrument uh, that worked, hey, that was a good day. <laughs> So we've all been there. Yeah, you know, if there's one person I would really, if anyone knows, what I really want to have on the show, I want to find out the person that was picking colors and interior <laughs> schemes in the 70s in these airplanes. Because I can tell you, when we got, uh, when, when I first got the plane that we've got right now, it was, it was tan, and it, the original color was tan with bright orange-like stripes on it. Yeah. And someone had tried to cover it with a rattle can of black, and so... It, <laughs> Yeah, there's there's some rough rough looking things from those times, but that makes sense. So you go from physics and lasers to uh, you know early 1940s technology that's barely been up uh, you know maintained since then. Well, you know uh, the VOR technology is really interesting. You know, it's a for electronicers like you, it's just a null detector, uh, and you know you learn the principles fairly easily compared to what's behind your uh, Garmin in the panel right now or your Dynon. And Absolutely. So, and, and you were spending a lot of time. So tell me a little bit about the flying that you did then, um, because the, those, those certainly were the roll up your sleeves and kind of like, uh, you know, bang on your, your chest days of IFR navigation and you know, <laughs> days of the giants that we talk about. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I had a great... An initial instructor, Andy Angelo, uh, who even when the radio worked, he wouldn't let you use it. Uh, and, and you really learned pilotage, which was great until you started having some clouds. <laughs> and so I definitely remember the day I decided I was going to get an instrument rating. I was visiting a girlfriend down uh, in Philadelphia and uh, was coming back to grad school, trying to get from, um, this was probably Northeast Philly, up back to Hanscom Field on a day after a warm front had passed. And you know the slope of a warm front and all of that, well, it's real, and it had passed. And uh, as I was going Northeast, it just started getting lower and lower and lower. And I decided Solberg, New Jersey was the promised land and uh, put down in, uh, in the metropolis of Solberg. Uh, and um, I do remember there were a couple of times on final where the runway wasn't too distinct. Um, and <laughs> spent uh, three nights in, uh, in Solberg uh, before the front finally passed and I could get back to uh, Bedford. Wow. And decided That's... instrument rating, I got to get me one of them. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. So, <laughs> so take me through then how you get, as you get a little further along, you start getting, you know, a lot closer to, to getting out of school and looking at what you're going to do for work. 
And, uh, and this is the path that ended up taking you closer and closer to NASA. So I, um, I was offered a, a number of industry jobs, including a very lucrative one with Raytheon, uh, not too far outside Boston. And uh, I, I decided I'd call up a friend of mine uh, who I had known. He was a grad student when I was working in a lab of his advisor as an undergrad. And he was doing some planetary astronomy, looking at the uh, moons of Jupiter and, and other kind of interesting things in the solar system. This was before Voyager did its grand tour. And so I called him up and I said, you know, is there any chance I might get a postdoc uh, working for um, uh, Professor Richard Goody, who he was working for at the time, and it transpired that um, uh, Richard was looking for somebody to work on a project to map the planet Venus in the uh, infrared and look at the weather on Venus uh, at the time that four spacecraft were going to enter the atmosphere of Venus. And so, you know, you can't see the surface of Venus, but you can sure see the clouds and you can measure the temperature, just like the IR pictures we all use when we're uh, pre-briefing for a flight. Uh, you know, at, at night you, you use all of the IR stuff. And wait a minute, let me see, I've got a picture right here. Oh, let's see. Um, this is one of the thermal images we took of Venus. And you can see, let me tilt it a little bit so the lights aren't getting it. You can see kind of the axis of it from here. Here's a big hurricane around the, the pole of it. And you can see the, uh, the warm and the cold parts. And it was just, it was a lot of fun uh, doing that kind of stuff from telescopes in uh, Tucson. And, you know, we only had about 40 minutes a day where we could take these thermal images. And um, it was pretty neat. Well, plus I got to fly sailplanes out of Tucson a little bit. <laughs> That's very, very cool. Wow. So, and was that pre-Jet uh, uh, Propulsion Laboratory, pre-JPL? Yeah, that was, that was uh, work that was done at the Center for Earth and Planetary Physics at Harvard in conjunction with a 1978 mission that NASA did called Pioneer Venus hmm. that was being run out of NASA's Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. And I got to know some of the JPL people who were working on uh, that, and so they offered me a position out of JPL, and um, they offered to double my salary, <laughs> which actually wasn't too very hard. Uh, yeah. I remember Harvard was paying me $11,700 a year. So uh, I moved out to Pasadena, um, which had the benefit of slightly better weather than, Calif than uh, um, Bedford, you know, and uh, JPL had a great flying club. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit better. Um, although they, you know, there weren't too very many earthquakes in Boston. That's um, true. <laughs> I, I do remember, you know, the first earthquake when I was in uh, L.A., uh, I was sitting with a, a friend of mine, a geologist from Hawaii, who was staying with me, and I heard the garden gate rattle. And I said, oh, somebody must have come in. And he said, nope, look up at the chandelier, which was going back and forth. And I said, oh, he's a geologist. He probably knows what he's doing. <laughs> and the good, second one. Good friend or roommate. Yeah. <laughs> the second one, I was up on the ninth floor of JPL's headquarters building in the men's room taking a leak and there were white caps in the urinal. <laughs> oh, I decided I'd probably take the stairs and get out of there pretty quick. <laughs> That's awesome. But JPL had uh, 172 RGs flying out of uh, El Monte um, Airport and uh, Great Field uh, and uh, so we flew out of there and I flew all around the the West Coast and over to Grand Canyon. And uh, the 172 RG was a great airplane with one exception. And that was right by the pilot's right leg and by the front seat passenger's left leg. There's a hydraulic power pack that looks like this. And it's all 
full of purple hydraulic fluid. How do I know the color? Because when it fails, it leaks all over your foot. <laughs> and, uh, and you learn the emergency procedures for the gear pretty easy. And, and um, so I, I got pretty familiar with those EPs. <laughs> but you know, awesome. it was great going out to Catalina or up to Big Bear. Um, it, you could always impress uh, uh, very nice looking people. <laughs> I think I think we think we know what that's code that's code for. <laughs> so um, so tell me how how that connects to to then landing you at uh, NASA. So NASA had its first post Apollo astronaut selection in 1978, and they hired 35 folks, about half military and half civilian. Although I don't remember the exact numbers, Wikipedia does. Uh, and, and I had not seen the announcement for that, but I sure saw when they got selected and I became aware that it was possible, wearing glasses, uh, <laughs> to become an astronaut. And so when the next selection rolled around in 1980, I applied, I uh, got, I, I don't know, there were probably seven or 8,000 people that applied then. And they interviewed 120 folks, and I got um, crammed into the very last of those interview groups. They interviewed six groups of 20 people uh, and went down to Johnson Space Center for a week. And of course, most of that week was physical exams, uh, but some of it was figuring out whether you like the shuttle program as well as whether the program liked you. They gave us a lot of briefings on the shuttle, which of course hadn't flown by then. Uh, and you know, the the big change in mindset for a lot of the folks coming out of the service was that NASA was a very minor budget compared to theirs. And on the other hand, from the the engineering and science folks, uh you weren't doing your own thing. It was all uh, part of a team effort. And so those of us, you know, who've worked on big astronomy teams or whatever, that was fun. Some people, uh, just like some of the single seat fighter pilots, uh, weren't so attuned to that. Although, you know, a lot of them of course are. Anyway, so I didn't get selected that year. And the next selection wasn't for four years. Well, partway through that time, I remember on a um, uh, overcast day in Pasadena, I took a long walk, and it occurred to me that I would really regret it when I was 60 years old if I hadn't done everything I could to get into space. So I called up the gentleman who was the head of the astronaut selection board and asked him much more roundabout and politely, why didn't you select me? And um, he said a little bit more roundabout, not very politely. Well, because we thought you were a pointy headed scientist and not a team player. So why don't you come down here and um, uh, work for us for a while and, and we'll check you out. Um, so they offered me a job in the mission control center in one of the back rooms, uh, working on the payload flight operations team. And uh, I threw over my scientific career, moved to Houston just before Thanksgiving in 1982, uh, and worked in the back rooms of the Mission Control Center. I uh, learned everything I could about the shuttle, took a lot of the training, read a lot, uh, worked my way up to uh, the, the front room as the payload uh, flight control officer there, and worked a, a whole lot of shuttle missions, a lot of which were really, really fun. Wow. I mean, that, that's fascinating to me. So you went from the physics side and the real the science and, and cutting edge and mapping, you know, Venus and these things and to just deciding you're going to do whatever it takes to find your way into space, which which meant NASA and mission control, not in in, you know, creating cutting edge new science, but operations, basically. Absolutely. And, and you know, all pilots love ops. Uh, and I certainly do. And uh, it, Mission Control Center was just a great time. And uh, 
Gene Kranz was still there when I first got there. Uh, really? And I remember him roaming at two in the morning, roaming around the back rooms. And in those days, we didn't have uh, a lot of digital archives where you could just pull up graphs in a spreadsheet. We had strip chart recorders. And the strip chart recorders had um, pretty sketchy kind of timing things on them. They had little tick marks for the timing and it was in a hexadecimal code. And so crayons would come around the back rooms and make sure you knew how to read that code. <laughs> so, um, and uh, we, had some, we had some good times. I remember on uh, the seventh shuttle flight, STS-7, uh, Bob Crippen commanding, uh, Sally Ride was operating the remote manipulator arm. It was her first mission. And there was a German satellite called the uh, SPAS, the shuttle pallet something satellite. Uh, and Sally lifted it out of uh, the cargo bay with the remote manipulator on the crane. And it was hotter than any of the engineers had thought. The computer in it, the CPU and the other electronics uh, was getting pretty hot. And it, had, it was getting pretty close to busting the limits that had been set pre-flight. And the engineers who had built it were kind of giving everybody the deer in the headlights stare. They, they couldn't cope with the real-time operations. So uh, Graham Collins, who was a Rockwell engineer, uh, and I started graphing the temperatures versus time, and it was pretty clear that they were going up and then just leveling off. And um, so we were briefing the, fir the fir <laughs> front room uh, flight controller, Jimmy Gaucher, and all of a sudden the voice of God, the flight director, comes on. Uh, and he says, payloads? Are you recommending we deploy? You know, and, and we're sitting in the back room just shaking. And and uh, Jimmy Co Gaucher is uh, is saying, yeah, it looks pretty good. And so flight says, payload data, what's your recommendation? And so Graham and I said, uh, we think it's going to level off. We think you should deploy. And they did. And, wow. and that was just a real fun moment. You know, it it um, it all comes down to you're taking responsibility for things. And, and that's why we had a lot of pilots in, uh, in mission control. Um, you know, and, and of course, one of the famous ones is Paul Dye, editor of Kit Planes Magazine and um, builder extraordinaire. And, uh, and we had a lot of uh, pilots who came up through flight control, including uh, Mr. Kranz. Wow. And uh, you know, we all see the, in movies, in real life, the, the, those iconic images of mission control that look so amazing. And I, I, I think this is the first time I've really thought about it in terms of these, these people are, many of them are pilots. Some yeah. of them are going to become astronauts. That's something that never occurred to me, that the people who are working in mission control uh, uh, may, may be on that path. Uh, you know, and, and I got interviewed in the 1984 selection and again, didn't get selected. So what went through my mind was, well, I'll wait around for one more selection. I don't know how long it's going to be. And either three strikes and you're out or a third time's the charm. And it ended up that they needed people the very next year. And I was very lucky uh, and, and got uh, selected as one of the 13 people in my class. There were two other folks from Mission Control, a, a brilliant guy who did the trajectories and rendezvous techniques called Rick Hebe, uh, and uh, a person I've worked with in payloads, a very good friend of mine called Linda Godwin. Linda and I ended up uh, phasing into flights where we got uh, put on the same flight twice. So I flew with Linda uh, two out of my four flights. And so, yeah, we, we had some good times down there. Wow. So when did you get called up? out of uh, out of mission control you're in mission control you're working payload how did this um, transition happen so um the fellow who was the head of the selection board uh, mr george abbey uh calls everybody individually and um you get a phone call and uh, he says would uh would you still like to uh do this and um of course nobody in the history of the world has ever said no 
<laughs> <laughs> so came down there, um, you, you know, I, I, everybody came down and uh, we had a press opportunity and uh, there was a fourth person who was at the Johnson Space Center, one of the uh, staff pilots uh, who was there, Steve Oswald. And um, we, we had known each other, uh, the four of us there, but we got to know the other people in the group. And then we all started training in August of 85. And of course, the first shuttle crash, the Challenger crash, uh, came while we were doing training, January 27th of 86. And so none, nobody flew for 30 months while we recovered from that. And uh, we all got a lot of training. Mm -hmm. um, the, Linda and I were the first of our class, class to get assigned a flight, although we were not the first to fly. There was a DOD uh, payload that outprioritized us, and we, uh, we ended up flying the second uh, bunch in our, in our class, but that was fine. Our class really got to know the system pretty well. You know, we were there for six years before we flew, and um, so we, we got to know everybody was around, and uh, I think it, it stood our class in, uh, in good stead. Wow. What, what does training entail? What does it mean to be, to be training for, well, for the position? There's a lot of book learning and classes, um, and uh, then getting into the simulators one system at a time, uh, and then full up training in simulators, you know, that look a lot like the ones in flight safety or simucom. Um, and uh, then once you get assigned to a crew, the flow really picks up. And do, do, do people train for different roles or are they very focused on what their role is? Um, the military test pilots are the only ones who can land and take off the shuttle. Mm -hmm. Although folks who came in uh, with my kind of background were flying the shuttle simulator a lot to test out all of the software. And, and I was never signed to that, but those people were real good pilots. Um, and then people got assigned to do various things at various times. I got assigned to follow a particular payload, which was a big 36,000 pound astronomical observatory called the Gamma Ray Observatory, being built by TRW out in uh, LA, and um, helped develop the techniques for carrying that up in the shuttle and taking it out of the shuttle. And I ended up getting assigned to the flight that was carrying that up. Meanwhile, a bunch of us had been worried that we were not doing any spacewalks. The last one had been uh, two or three flights before the Challenger crash. And uh, it had been a long time. And we knew there was a big mound of spacewalks uh, that was going to hit us in the face if we were going to build the space station. So um, Ed Whitsitt, who was the head of the, um, the space suit branch, and I were musing about that one day. And I came at Ed's office and I, and I said, look, this flight that I've been following, I hadn't been assigned to it, has uh, a couple of tons of excess weight uphill that we could take. Uh, do you think we could put an EVA flight demo on that? And we ended up getting the people from Langley uh, and a few other folks involved and came up with um, an EVA flight demonstration. And um, we got assigned to the flight. And Jerry Ross, who was an experienced EVA uh, crew member having done the previous spacewalk with his crewmate Woody Spring, and I got assigned to be the EVA crew members. And lo and behold, that demonstration got approved. So we had the first planned spacewalk uh, in five and a half years. Wow. And we ended up having to do an emergency spacewalk. Oh, sorry, NASA calls them unscheduled EVA. <laughs> we had to do an emergency spacewalk the day before when um, a big radio antenna on the bottom of the Gamma Ray Observatory failed uh, to come out when the robotic systems tried to uh, move it, and, and we ended up having to go out and, and fix that. And uh, I took a bunch of tools, and Jerry went out unencumbered by tools and got under the spacecraft, and he's a pretty strong guy and muscled up and just uh, moved the antenna on its own uh, a little bit and then 
we were around with the tools to the other side and we cranked it out 135 degrees so it deployed from the underside of the spacecraft all the way out to its uh, its um, position where it sent data back, back down to the ground. So that was a um, uh, pretty nice first flight. <laughs> wow. Do you, do you, I mean, you must, do you remember the first moment that you stepped foot outside the aircraft? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. We had trained, of course, for the plan spacewalk, but we'd always trained with the lights on. <laughs> if it was dark, it was <laughs> night when we went out. And the suit. We thought of everything but that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was darker than the inside of a cow. Uh, and so, yeah, there was some um, some stuff we hadn't really trained for. <laughs> and, and we didn't really know whether we could fix that. The ground had faxed us up a procedure that was their best guess. And we looked at it, and we knew the spacecraft pretty well, and said, man, nah, that's not going to work. Um, <laughs> and, and our commander, who uh, was just a hero in, in my book, um, Steve Nagel, unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, Steve said, fellas, I'm going to tell the ground we're on board with their procedure. And you guys go outside and do what you need to do. Uh, <laughs> and that was about the bravest thing that I've heard anybody say in a space flight. Because if, if it hadn't worked out, he'd have been a goat. Wow. And, uh, uh, but it ended up working out. And, and uh, so 16 minutes later, we'd, uh, we'd fix that. Uh, and while the ground checked out their systems, actually what they were doing, I guess, was restarting their hearts. Uh, we started to get ahead at some of the tasks we were doing the next day anyway and got a lot of that done. And then um, they told us to get back inside the airlock while Linda released uh, the satellite and Steve moved the shuttle out from underneath this spacecraft that didn't have its, its own systems for doing that. Well, our toes were in the airlock. We had a pretty good view uh, when Linda released it. It was it was very nice. So, wow. And the other thing about that space flight, Jeff, was it was just before Mount Pinatubo exploded and put hundreds of tons of volcanic ash into the atmosphere. The atmosphere was super clear, and we were flying real high, um, and and we could see a thousand miles in any direction. We took a lot of really nice pictures on that flight. That's amazing. Was there any? Is there any vertigo when you're looking out uh, like that? Is there any? What, what's it? You know, it's interesting. The the only time I felt really a sense of up or down was we were doing a experiment on the on the second spacewalk where we were standing in a, in a foot uh, plate, foot restraint, we call it. And we were cranking on something, so we put a bunch of weight on our feet. And I remember thinking, huh, that feels like down to me, and looking out <laughs> over the wing at the Andes rushing by. And that was a cool feeling. I suppose some people would think it was disturbing, but I just thought it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And that was, I, I, it was really neat. I want to show a couple of pictures of some of this because uh, there, there's, there's really something. It, it's remarkable. So let me, uh, let me bring a couple of these up so that people can see. Um, and I'm going to start with this ah, just amazing launch picture. How gorgeous that is! On my second flight, and uh, the windows that you could see kind of facing up. My helmet was underneath one of those. I was the flight engineer assigned on that flight. Hoot Gibson was in the left seat. Kurt Brown was in the right seat. Uh, Mark Lee was to my right. Uh, and uh, Jan Davis and Memorial Mori and Mae Jemison were down in the, uh, on the mid deck. Uh, and uh, it, it was just great. When the solid rocket boosters light, you know you're going someplace. It's a great ride. That's awesome. Uh, and and of course this is you and, and uh, all decked out. This is this this must be the the picture. Well, you know when you get assigned to a spacewalk, you get to take a picture like this, uh, and you know they give you some hair coloring so your hair doesn't look like this. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was a little younger in those days. This you know, the suit weighs about 250 pounds on the ground. Uh, well, it wasn't you know full of consumables. 
And so uh, the trick is smiling when you're wearing it on the ground. Of course, it doesn't weigh anything in, in space. You can feel the mass. <laughs> Let's see, there's um, a couple others. Let me shift over from this to a couple other really interesting shots as well that, uh, that we have from you. Ah, so that's our, our second spacewalk. And Jerry wearing the red stripes and me with the vertical there are working on a recalcitrant piece of IT gear uh, where the connectors wouldn't mate. And so uh, I needed Jerry to hold the box, which wasn't designed to be held, while I muscled up and, uh, and mated uh, a big Canon connector that any of us who fly old airplanes are used to. Absolutely, that's, that's that was, was a happening. very, very cool shot to say the least. But <laughs> this one is amazing to me. Uh, so that's a, a hurricane that sat off Tampa for, I don't know, three or four days just pumping moisture into Tampa. Uh, and, you know, you can see the eye and the wall of thunderstorms around the eye. Well, of course, living in Houston, we were no stranger to hurricanes. It's a lot better to see it from up there, I'll tell you. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing to see. I, I always find it breathtaking to see massive weather systems in these, these yeah. pictures from outer space. It's really fascinating. It's, it's great. I mean, uh, it's almost as good as seeing it um, on XM weather or ADSB weather. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, now there's another one here, and that you're definitely going to have to explain to everyone. Ah, so that's a picture that I took on our third mission. That's the aurora, the southern lights in this case, and it's sitting about 60 miles above the Earth in a layer of the atmosphere that is ionized, and so the aurora can uh, take place and. So it looks like the burners on the top of a gas stove. That kind of light that you see coming out of the shuttle is one of our small thrusters, our 25-pound uh, thrusters, uh, that was firing to keep the radars in the shuttle bay, which was our payload, that mission pointed right where they should be. And so um, I got lucky and, and captured the shuttle thruster firing in the aurora and the stars that you can see uh, through the aurora, it's a little bit of a time exposure, so you can see the stars uh, aren't points, they're trailed a little bit. That's fascinating, and I never, you always think about the northern lights because of where we live, yeah. but I don't really think about the southern lights. I didn't actually ever see the northern lights from space, although I took my Beach 18 up to the bottom of Hudson's Bay, a town called Moosonee, uh, to show my kids the, uh, the northern lights one time and uh, and that was a lot of fun wow and we've got a couple others here oh yes yeah. so that's we always pose these pictures over water where there's nothing to take a picture of and that's me with one of the Hasselblads we all take pictures of each other with the cameras on board and Hasselblad <laughs> is a great camera you know two and a quarter by two and a quarter and you can blow it up to the size of you know a bed if you wanted to they're just great camera and then here uh, that's my favorite picture that I took of the aurora, again, the southern lights, and that's the constellation Orion. And that orange glow that you see near Orion's head, by the way, Orion looks funny to us from the northern hemisphere. That's because it's taken from the southern hemisphere. Uh, but that orange glow is the air glow layer. And, you know, it's, it's ionized sodium, or sorry, it's, it's neutral sodium that the sunlight hits. Uh, and it's at about 58, 96 angstroms. Um, I'm dating myself, those are old units. And it glows in the orange there when the sunlight hits it. So that was just before dawn when you could still see the aurora and the stars. Wow, what an amazing picture. And this, this is- That's, that's a great National Geographic photographer, later freelancer, uh, Roger Ressmeyer, who is teaching uh, Three of us, some of the finer points of, of using cameras, we'd asked him to come down there and supplement the excellent NASA trainers who did that stuff. And Roger was just a super wizard, as most National Geographic photographers are. But um, he, he just passed away a couple of years ago. But uh, his books on 
on space photography from the ground are incredible. So that's Frank Culbertson next to me, who was uh, the uh, commander of the space station during the time of the 9-11 attacks. And next to him is Bill Reedy, who was the commander of my fourth mission up to the Russian space station, Mir. Wow. A uh, couple more here. So that's our third flight where we had the big JPL radars. We had three different frequency colors radars uh, taking images of the Earth. And that mission and two follow-on missions are responsible for the elevations that you see when you got onto Google Earth or any other mapping program. Uh, really? Uh, the Earth in three dimensions uh, and uh, ours in the follow-on mission, STS-68, proved that you could do interferometry um, from radars in space. And then there was a wonderful follow-on mission that, that did it in, in one flight. Just terrific work by some folks at JPL, including Mike Kobrick and uh, Joby Way there and, and the whole JPL imaging team under Charles Lachey. Wow, and this is one more that you took. Ah, so my fourth flight, we were lucky enough to go up to the Russian space station Mir and bring back Dr. Shannon Lucid, an Oklahoma chemist who had been selected as an astronaut in 1978. And she'd been up there for six months. Uh, it was supposed to be four and a half months, but as she said, men are always late. Uh, <laughs> and so we, we'd had hydrogen and brittle problem on uh, one of the fuel ducts and so we were late. Uh, anyway, that's a picture that I took using some of the techniques that Roger Resmeyer taught us. I put a slave's strobe with a blue gel uh, on uh, Shannon's back there, and it gives you that kind of cool, techy blue light uh, in the airlock of the of um, the docking module there. That is so so cool. Um, do you have the book to show? Because there's there's that yeah. wonderful so, book. This, this is not hyping the book because we, uh, we published this in 1996. So all you can get is you know, copies on uh, Albris and, and news places like that. But there, there are some pretty good copies there. But the National Geographic um, published it. By the way, that's kind of like um, uh, going mist when the weather's too bad. National Geographic was one of 13 publishers that turned it down. They turned it down before they finally accepted it. Uh, and, you know, like I said, there were 12 other publishers that had turned it down. And uh, we just got so annoying that they finally accepted it. And How do you turn down a book of photographs from space from NASA astronauts? Well, nothing like that had been done. And, and we were doing it in a different way. We were digitizing the original uh, film, you know, NASA gives you copies of copies of copies, and the resolution and the contrast really suffers. Um, and so we convinced NASA to let us digitize the um, the original images, and uh, we paid. Well, actually, Bill Gates's company, Corbis, paid for uh, making a scanner that would not touch the original film except on the edges, and. Uh, um, that's how this book came out. And Geographic thought, well, it might sell 20 or 30,000 copies. So they printed 30,000 copies. It's ended up um, selling 600,000 copies in 11 languages. So, you know, if you missed your numbers by that much, either plus or minus, you wouldn't be working anymore. But <laughs> I guess the book business is a little funny. <laughs> so, so tell me when your love for photography came and, and, how that kind of connects and ties all this together. But the, because these are some wonderful pictures that you've taken and I would encourage anyone out there, I know it's certainly on my list to go and search for the book and try to find a used copy because it is, it's gorgeous. Um, so I was introduced into photography by my father. Uh, he had been a photographer, uh, you know, before he went to college, and he'd taken a camera in World War II, uh, and he'd taken lots of images, all of which were destroyed when a typhoon hit Okinawa um, in, uh, I guess, 1945. Um, and so, he, you know, he continued doing photography, and I remember 
we had a dark room uh, in dad's workshop in the basement and he taught me how to enlarge and develop you know prints and how to uh, process film and I just took photographs all through college and uh, in grad school and um, had I remember my first camera that I I had uh, bought was a Zeiss Icon Contaflex Super uh, old film camera great camera with a cadmium sulfide uh, light meter and just really nice camera but you and, know many of us who are pilots Base is that something that a lot of that was, uh, you know, what what was allowed that allowed you to expand this uh, uh, into your so, space? You know, most of us who fly love to look out the window, and a lot of us take cameras with us on pretty much every flight, and um, so it's a natural in space. And John Glenn talked NASA into letting him take a camera, which Wally Shira bought for him in a camera shop it was an Ansco auto set, first camera in space. NASA, uh, you know, thought, eh, won't do that. The photographs were captivating, absolutely amazing photographs. Uh, and after that flight, no one has been in space on our side anyway without a camera. That makes so much sense, of course. But in, you've obviously done this way outside of just what you've done in space, you've done it in general aviation. I'll show a couple more here. Um, oh, well, so that's from that's from the shuttle. Okay. Uh, that is one of the first two photographs taken of cities at night. And that was a handheld four second hand exposure. I took two rolls and out of the 72 exposures, only two came out. One of them happened to be of New York City. So. <laughs> That, you know, you can see Long Island and Central Parks, the dark space and uh, Long Island going out to the right, Connecticut up to the top right, the towns of Connecticut and Newark over there. So uh, I got lucky on that one. Wow. And then here's a couple that's, others. That's from our third mission. And that's a photograph over uh, Kazakhstan. And that's just in, that's in April, late April. And the snow has just started to retreat. And you can see the, uh, the wind rose there that prevented a dust bowl over in Kazakhstan uh, when they farmed. And not very far from there is where the Trans-Siberian uh, Railway ran. That's uh, Onikatana Island, a volcanic island off uh, the north coast of Japan. Uh, again, taken on that third mission, STS-59. Just uh, beautiful to see these volcanic islands in the snow. Wow. And I do not want to miss the opportunity here also to get a little bit of uh, of your, your personal aircraft experience here um, because people need to see our pride and joy. And this is... <laughs> ah, so that's my current uh, V-35B, just a terrific airplane and uh, got an IO-550 and tip tanks and TKS. Uh, you know, nothing fancy up front. It's a six pack, although it has an HSI but it's got a 430W and um, you know, I've got everything I need with my iPad and a, uh, uh, a flight stream 210 so that the iPad um, can send the flight plans up to the 430W. It's a it's, terrific it's airplane. It's beautiful. It's a gorgeous airplane. I love that. And then, well, this actually is back to your NASA days. We have one more, or a couple more I want uh, to make sure. So that is either Bill Reedy or Terry Wilkett who were the, commander and pilot respectively on uh, my fourth mission, coming down from 10,000 feet at a uh, about, well, call it roughly a 20 degree glide slope angle, training for landing the shuttle. This was a, at night. And the vertical part of that is the wingtip lights of the Grumman Gulf Stream that was configured to fly a lot like the shuttle. And then as they go overhead, uh, you can see the, the horizontal uh, wingtip lights and I cut off the exposure um, before the uh, the noise could rattle me and my camera. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is very very cool. And then last because it is a couple pictures that are so cool here, and that is your ah, Beach 18 days. So the one in the foreground is my twin beach, and the one in the background is uh, the late Walter Atkinson's uh, twin beach. And uh, that was in formation near Cadillac, Michigan. 
we'd formed up uh, with a Bonanza and uh, the Bonanza was the photo ship and just, um, it, it was a lot of fun in those days. That was great. And then oh, well, it sometimes snows in Michigan. So uh, <laughs> this, was, uh, this was a day when I'd shot an instrument approach, the weather was good, the ceiling was about, oh, I don't know, 1,200 feet, and the visibility was seven or eight miles. So, you know, it was easy instruments, but I broke out and I couldn't see the runway. Why? Because it was covered with snow. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and missed and In the hole, I called the guys, and they came out with a plow and plowed the end of the runway so I could see it. <laughs> Just enough so you can actually see the, see the color on all of that. Well, that is just absolutely amazing, and um, I mean, boy, what what a what a story! Are you going to be out at Oshkosh this year? I will be at Oshkosh, absolutely. At so least for the first few days. All right. Well, if anyone manages to track you down, they'll be able to they'll, they'll have some more stories to know about here as as well. And again, of course, there's the book. There's so much of your photography. And I just want to thank you so much for taking some time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. It, you've, you've led a, a remarkable life and continue to teaching uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon and all the other work that you do. And, and I just want to say thank you for all of that. Well, Jeff, thank you for Social Flight. As, as I said earlier, before too many people were on, I used it just a little while ago to go down to a pancake breakfast in Cumberland, Maryland. Uh, and what you do with Social Fight Live really kept my spirits up during the pandemic. So well, thank, thank you. you. That's very, very kind of you to say. So uh, I, I wish you a very good time, Blue Skies, and good night to you. And to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And to all of you, I'd like to thank you again for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We really do appreciate it and hope that we're doing everything that we can to support you and to support the rest of general aviation and keep you all going and in the air as much as possible. Next week, we will be back on Tuesday, June 7th with an AVSIG reunion, the first days of the bulletin board days uh, on the internet and uh, chatting, and it really produced some remarkable individuals that were there in the first day and become leaders in general aviation. We are going to be joined by Mike Bush, George Brawley, and Barry Schiff. Uh, Jay App was also part of that early crew, and uh, but unfortunately, he's not available to join us again next week. It's going to be a remarkable show and a lot of fun. On Tuesday, June 14th, we will have Nilofar Rahmani, the first female Air Force aviator in Afghanistan's history. And her story is absolutely remarkable and breathtaking. And so I'm really, really looking forward to hearing from her and letting her uh, in on some of her experiences around the world. On Tuesday, June 21st, we are also here back with AME extraordinaire, Dr. Brent Blue. And we're gonna hear a lot of things about what he thinks about the FA process and uh, some of the things that are good as well as the bad and what the future holds for all of us when it comes to medical certification. And so with that, I would like to thank you all again for joining us this evening, and I wish you all blue skies.